<clears throat> a 16 year old. Mm -hmm. um, this, this first table is like a chart to help through um, liver function tests, tests. You can go through it later. Like if you find raised bilirubin and raised ALP, alkaline phosphatase or ALT, you check if the person has drondis or no drondis. If they have drondis, you do immediate medical assessment. If there's not um, drondis, you request liver screening, but do not await the test. Like we, you, you, you can go through this and then like, internalize it. So we can just start with question one. Mm. Mm -hmm. A 16 year old fractured femur and multiple bones from, fractured femur and multiple bones from an accident. There was an isolated ALP rise other LF, LFTs are normal. What was the likely cause and another pos and another possible explanation? Um, what do you guys think is a possible cause for this isolated ALP rise? Keeping in mind that this uh, boy had a femur fracture and multiple bones were broken in the accident. And does and does someone have an idea? I'll just go, go through the mini. So we have isolated LP. LP is usually present in the bone, liver, intestine, placenta, or when there's neoplasia, and it reflects osteoblastic activity predominantly. So from this, um, from this patient, this 16-year-old, the isolated LP rise can show that there's increased osteoblastic activity. Osteoblasts make a uh, blast, like make newborn. So it, it could reflect bone healing due to increased osteoblastic activity. And then um, also, we let's talk about some other reasons that could cause a high level of ALP. There's Paget's disease, rickets or osteomalacia, hyperbarath hyperparathyroidism and osteogenic carcin car carcinoma. Yeah, those are some other reasons that could, other reasons why LP could be re raised. But for this specific person, it's rele what's relevant to this case was him having a fracture and that the bones were repairing and reforming, so yeah. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. So um, growth spurt, usually teenagers have a growth spurt and the ALP will be will rise, but this is irrelevant to this. So the, the, likely, the most likely cause is the ALP bone healing due to increased osteoblastic activity and the ribs fracture might have, they give another possible explanation. The, they said multiple bones. So if that person had rib fractures, they might have injured other organs like the kidney, which could cause the rise in ALP. Um, are we okay with that question? Like, can we move to the next question? Okay. <laughs> Um, the next question was um, lab tests for AMI acute myocardial infarction. Um, this one, it's the other table we'll go through. Um, depending on the onset, uh, total creatinine kinase is four to eight hours onset. Peak activity is 24 to 48 hours. Then it lasts three to five days. AST, six to eight hours, the onset, peak activity, 24 to 48, duration, four to six, 
then LDH, 12 to 24 hours, then the peak activity is 48 to 72 hours, and then duration is 7 to 1 week, 7 days, 7 days. Um, here, they usually even ask about the, they usually ask the for tumor, necrosis, where the, let me go through that table. Uh -huh. The biochemical markers for necrosis, myoglobin, CKMB, troponin T, and troponin I, where troponin, um, Myoglobin, the detection is detected one to four hours. It's the first one to be detected. Then uh, the peak rise is six to seven hours. Duration is one day. So a person who had like um, myocardial infarct, which was followed by necrosis and comes like two days after, it's less likely for us, for people to find the myoglobin. <clears throat> then CKMB, three to 12 hours, the detection. Um, peak rise is usually 12 to 18 hours. Then duration is two to three days. Then troponin T is three to 12 hours. The peak rise is 12 to 48. Duration is five to 14, to 14 days. Then troponin I, three to six days, 12 to 24 hours is the peak rise. Then five to seven days is the duration. So usually these uh, people who had myocardial infarcts, which are followed by necrosis, usually have increased uh, the troponin I is the last to, the troponin is the last to be increased and lasts longer than the others. You can see that from this chart, yeah. Can we go to the next question? Mm -hmm. So, they just said it was a thiamine deficiency by an alcoholic, and usually they can they can present with. How do I? Let me send. Are you guys in the group in the in the WhatsApp group? I'll send you guys a picture of the of the case that we thought these questions are uh, someone was just remembering it was some physical sports so those people are just saying what they remember so they say time and deficiency related to alcohol so we thought maybe they showed them uh, a brain showing Wanike Wanike Kosakov syndrome yeah so you can just check different MRIs to be familiar with it. But let me let me just snip it and send it to you right now so that you can follow through. So that uh, those are some of the sim symptoms associated with um, the Wanike Kosakov syndrome. And then um, if unrecognized and untreated, it may be followed by prolonged, prolonged and largely irreversible condition called the Kosakov. So the Wanike encephalopathy is caused by the thiamine deficiency and it, it's a combination of psychotic syndrome, symptoms and ophthalmoplegia. So these first two are for Wanike. Then if it's untreated, it's prolonged, and prolonged, it's, it, it becomes Kosakov syndrome, which is characterized by shorter memory and confabulation. Uh, Wanike encephalopathy is characterized by foci of hemorrhage and necrosis in the mammillary bodies and the walls of the third and fourth ventricles. And it's usually a common setting of chronic alcoholism but it may be encountered in people with thiamine deficiency from gastric disorders like carcinomas, chronic gastritis, and persistent vomiting. Yeah, um, are we together? Okay, and then we have this uh, canemonic for the the 
So when it is encephalopathy, we've said it's caused by thiamine deficiency. They have confusion of thalmoplegia and ataxia. And then Kosakov psychosis usually is caused, is characterized by retrograde amnesia, anterograde amnesia, confabulation, and Kosakov psychosis. Yeah. So the, the mnemonic is called track. Cod for Wanike's encephalopathy, then cos rock for Kosakov's psychosis. Mm. Are we together? Can someone give a thumbs up or something? Okay. This is, uh, we've seen that for Kosakov psychosis, they have retrograde amnesia, anterograde amnesia, confabulation, then Kosakov's psychosis. Mm -hmm. I think we can go to the next question. This one was about, they just said hypercholesterolemia and management. So this catabo shows the Fredrickson classification of the hypercholesterolemias and we can go through it. Type 1 is usually called hyperchylomicronemia. What is increased is the chylomicrons. It's even in the name. So increased lipid fraction is the triglycerides. Then type 2A, also known as familial hypercholesterolemia. The increased lipoprotein is LDL, and the increased lipid fraction is cholesterol. So we'll have uh, cholesterol be like very high for this person. Then type 2B, familial combined hypercholesterolemia. We have L high LDL and VLDL, very low density lipoproteins and low density lipoproteins. Then what's increased here is cholesterol and triglycerides. Then type 3, this beta lipoproteinemia, LDL chylomicron remnants, then the increased lipid fraction is triglycerides and cholesterol. Uh, uh, someone asked me what exactly is Kosakov psychosis? Give me a second. So we've seen that people who have um who have, give me a second, let me go back to it. Uh -huh. So when you can cephalopathy, which is untreated will lead to Kosakov syndrome. And the Kosakov syndrome we've seen is characterized by a certain uh, Kosakov psychosis. Like the person will have like the combination of all these, the anterograde amnesia, retrograde am amnesia, confabulation will constitute the Kosakov psychosis, like, yeah. Like this person will look like they're mad. But because of this, um, the combination of all these other factors, yeah. Mm -hmm. So here we've seen the types of the hypercholesterolemias. So we're going to, who can, so here they had said classifying the hypercholesterolemia and management. So uh, what are some of the managements of hypercholesterolemia? Okay, some, some yeah, dietary changes, statins, yes, lifestyle changes. Yes, everything is correct. Yeah, so this person would tell them um, dietary change, statins, like the lipid lowering agents, and yeah. Yes, 
and reducing alcohol lifestyle changes yes if they were smoking if they were and exercising yes yeah so that's the answer to the second part avoiding alcohol and smoking yeah mm -hmm. and yeah to eat healthily like yeah to eat less fats sugary beverages yeah Mm, I think we can go to the next question. We've answered this one. Okay, so who can... Um, so what do we think this person has? What can we see immediately? Exophthalmos, yes. Um, yes. And what, what's one condition that's usually associated? What could we think of after seeing this person? One condition they could most likely have. Say they told us this person. In, yeah. Graves disease, yes. Yeah, so um, this person most probably has Graves disease. And so what are the other characteristics of Graves disease? We know that it's a hyperthyroidism. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Yes. Goita, yes, yes. So, thank you guys. Uh -huh. So, there's a classical triad of graves, hypothyroidism, and it will cause enlargement of the gland, which will lead to goiter. Then, ophthalmopathy, which will cause this exophthalmos. And then, dermopathy, uh, which will cause pretibial myxedema. Uh -huh. So it's a, it's an endogenous hyperthyroidism. So who can help us? What's one the pathophysiology of Graves disease? Can someone help with this? Explain the pathophysiology of Graves. Low TSH, yes. What causes the low TSH? IgGS. Mm -hmm. So, yes. Mm -hmm. So um, Graves' disease is usually like an autoimmune disorder and it's characterized by overproduction of autoantibodies against thyroid proteins, especially the TSH receptor. So these um, antibodies will either stimulate or block the TSH receptor and will find them usually in blood. The most common type of, the most common antibody subtype is the TSI, thyroid stimulating immunoglobulin. And this TSI is mostly more specific for Graves disease. So if a patient has TSI, we think about um, Graves. And it's observed in almost all patients with Graves. Then TSI binds to the TSH receptor and mimics its function, stimulating adenylyl cyclase and increasing the release of thyroid hormones. Now we, we, we see why we have um, the hyperthyroidism. It's excessive. So TSI binds to TSH receptor and mimics its actions, then stimulates adenylate cyclase um, and releasing and shows a diffusely. Yes. So um, are we clear on that one? So it's an autoimmune disease. disease. And it's going to. Uh -huh. 
So B and T cell mediated autoimmunity leading to production of, of stimulating IgG against TSH receptor type two hypersensitivity, which increases thyroid function and growth leading to hyperthyroidism and diffuse goiter. Are we clear on that one? Okay, we can just go to the next question. Have we understood the, the pathophysiology of graves? Okay, let's just go to the next question. Uh, which HLA subtypes is associated with the above disease? Who can give it? HLA DR3 and HLA B8. Mm -hmm. So lab findings in graves, uh, let's help with this one. Like, what are we most likely to find? Someone has even already answered it. We have low TSH, so decreased TSH. Uh, what else will we most likely have? Given that we have hyper hyperthyroidism, so what will what happens to the um, thyroid hormones? T three, T four. What are their levels? What do we think is low TSH, high T three, and T four? Yes. Thank you so much. Yeah, so that's the, those are the lab findings. Low TSH, increased T3 and T4. Thank you very much, guys. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So um, since we're still on the thyroid, we can go through some of the conditions and say why we, and say the values we think. Um, Um, in primary hypothyroidism, what do we think is the TSH, T4, and T3 values, primary hypothyroidism? TSH, the TSH, T3, and T4. Primary hypo. Yeah, high TSH, low T4, and low T3, yes. And how about um, secondary hypothyroidism? Low, low everything. So the primary, the primary, it means like it's primarily in the thyroid, and then secondary, it's in the in, it's in the anterior pituitary, and then tertiary is in the hypothalamus because the hypothalam the hypothalamus releases thyroid releasing hormone, which goes to the anterior pituitary and stimulates it to release thyroid stimulating hormone, which stimulates the thyroid to produce T three and T four. So in primary in primary, the problem is with the is with the thyroid. So that's why we'll find we have um, high TSH. Because the we have hypo, the th thyroid is releasing a few hormones, T3 and T4 will be low. And then as a compensation, the anterior pituitary will increase the TSH, which is the thing, which is the reasoning behind the all our answers like yeah so if it's a secondary hypo hypothyroidism even the anterior pituitary is not releasing tsh so tsh t3 and t4 are all low which uh, and then subclinical hypothyroidism is subclinical hypothyroidism uh, no let's first do uh, primary hypothyroidism primary hypothyroidism what do we think are the values Primary hyper. So the problem is with, we've already, yeah, all of them are. Primary hyper. So that means the, the thyroid is releasing a lot of T3 and T4. So T3 will be high, T4 will be high, but as a compensation, 
the anterior pituitary will decrease the TSH because it's already high. So it it's like I need to stop stimulating the thyroid. Yeah. And then secondary, all of them are high. Yes, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, yeah. Tertiary, tertiary hypothyroidism. Tertiary, all of them are low. Tertiary hyper, all of them are high because it starts from the hypothalamus. So there's no way we're going to have increased. Like it's all going to be low or all going to be high. So we can go to the... But then for subclinical hypo, we have increased T TSH, but the, for subclinical, the, it's usually reflected at the level of the anterior pituitary, not the levels of the body. Like we might see that T3 and T4 are normal, but it's going to be reflected at the level of the anterior. Yeah. So yeah, I think we can go to the next question. I think we've done some of these. The main causes now of this are thyrotoxicosis. Primary hyper, low TSH, high T4, T3, serially caused by graves, multinodular toxicoita, autonomous toxic adenoma, iodine overdose, overload, secondary hyper, TSH producing pituitary adenoma, so thyroid hormone resistance or gestational thyrotoxicosis, then thyrotoxicosis without hyperthyroidism, subacute thyroiditis, silent thyroiditis, and thyrotoxicosis. And this table here reflects what we've been answering. Yeah, so you can go through it um, later. The next table. Yeah, this one is just saying TSH, if it's increased or decreased, and then we go through it. We've done this in there. So TSH, if it's increased, we check um, T4. Then T4, if it's increased, secondary hypothyroidism, and we can think of TSH secreting pituitary adenoma. If it's decreased, primary hypothyroidism. And then if it's just normal, subclinical, because we've already found TSH was increased. If TSH, is normal, we check T4. If it's increased, secondary hypothyroidism. If it's decreased, secondary hypo. Uh, hmm. And then decreased, we check T4. T4, if it's high, primary hypothyroidism. If it's low, secondary clinical hypothyroidism. Yeah. I think we can go to the next question. Do you guys, are we together on this one? Does anyone have a question on this, um, the thyroid hormone thingy? All right, I'll take that as a no. Uh -huh. So um, this person, what do you think this person has? I think I'll just do this one. It's a colon. As you can see, this person has a collar rash. Oh, the castle necklace. Yeah. And it's caused by a deficiency in vitamin B3 or niacin. And then it's characterized by a classical, yes. Thank you. Thank you, Nate. And then um, some symptoms of this um, triad, some things that this person might present with. What's the triad for the this color rush? 
anyone, anything. Yeah. If we think the three Ds, the, the mnemonic for this is the three Ds. Nursing deficiency, three Ds. Who can, okay. Death, dementia, yes, thank you so much. D diarrhea, dementia, dermatitis, then death. Week. Yes, diarrhea, dementia, dermatitis, death. So diarrhea, dementia, dermatitis, and we can add death. Mm. Mm -hmm. And then here we're going to go to the biochemical tubes. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Um, what do we have usually? The what are some biochemical tests that the what's in the red tube, the purple tube? Plain, nothing, yes. The plain, nothing, and th they usually ask, um, yes, Papo EDTA, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. uh, they usually, there's some questions where they ask, um, where, which tube is the CSF? CSF um, drawn in, and the answer for this is usually um, the plain tube, because for CSF, it usually goes in the plain tube. Then um, what tests can be done from the, but this is more hemat. Do we do that or we leave it? We leave it for hemat or we just cover it? What do you guys want? Okay, so um, some of the we say the purple is EDTA. What are some tests that we can do from the purple tube? Uh, from the purple tube top, top tube, tube top, that one. Yes, yes, the complete blood count. Yes. Um, what else, guys? The chromosomal analysis, ESR, yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Then the red tube, the red tube, what are some tests that we can uh, carry out from the red tube? Yes. Is the full hemogram for the purple tube or the red tube? Following blood gas analysis results were obtained from a 32 year old male brought to the emergency unit with severe bleeding following a motorcycle accident. A. What uh, let's go through them. pH is 7.18, it's low. PCO2 is 3.3, .3, it's low. P PO2 is 10.5, it's low. Uh, HCO3 is 14, low, low, low. The VE, negative 18. Sodium, 140, no more range. Potassium, high. And then uh, chloride is normal. Yes. So what is the acid-base derangement? And give reasons. Uh, can, what do we think is the acid-base derangement here?
Yeah, it's metabolic acidosis. Thank you so much. Uh huh. Yes, and it's partially compensated. So it's a partially compensated metabolic acidosis. Um, if we can recall from yesterday's um discussion, we talked about why it's the metabolic acidosis. HCO three is low, and then they lower PCO two. The then a person, when they have metabolic acidosis, they tend to hyperventilate. And in hyperventilating, they'll tend to reduce also PCO2 as a compensation, as a compensatory uh, mechanism. So um, what do, why do we think uh, we've given the reason? The pH is low, so it's an acidosis and HCO3 metabolic partially compensated because this level of um, PCO2 is lower than four. So calculate the anion gap and comment on it. Um, what? How do we calculate the anion gap? Um, how do we calculate the anion gap? Yes. Mm, yeah, we get the cations minus the anions. So we get the positive ones minus the negative ones. So in this person, what would we say is the um, the anion gap. Yeah, we get sodium plus potassium minus chloride plus uh, bicarbonate. So that will be um, 140 plus 5.3 minus the chloride, which is 102 plus 14. Like, uh, what can we say? Is this like high? Is it normal? Is it low? Uh, so the range is. The normal when we have potassium is 12 to 16. So when we have the potassium value, the range is 12 to 16, which is the case for this one. And without the potassium, it's eight to 12. So what's our comment on it? So with potassium, it's 12 to 16. Without potassium, it's eight to 12. So this goes in the high range. Yeah, the high and yes. So you remember yesterday when we were talking about metabolic acidosis, we talked about non-anion gap metabolic acidosis and anion gap metabolic acidosis. So any value that lies within the 12 to 16 range is the non-anion gap metabolic acidosis. But this one of ours is the anion gap metabolic acidosis, we have an anion gap. So um, for this person, we'll say, what is the likely cause of the acid-base disorder? We'll say things that are poor, 
Haya nayo ni gap metabolic acidosis. So um yesterday we talked about some of them what Someone has another uh a cat mad pile. Yes. A cat mad pile. The M is for methanol. Yes. Toxicity, then U uremia, then D diarrhea or diabetic ketoacidosis. Then uh, P, paraldehyde toxicity, I, isonazid toxicity, L, lactic acidosis, E, ethanol toxicity. I think you just would say, um, yeah. Well, see, you'd exhaust all of them, you know, so that um, so that you get as many marks. But I don't think they can be more than four. What do you can just give four? Yeah. So for the. I think can someone help me type the mud pile in the knee in the chat box? Doctor A was for the non anion gap, the diarrhea, renotubular acidosis, and acetazolamide use. Those are non anion gap. So the rest, yesterday we had used the ladder. Ladder. So the rest in the let me just um type it. Ladder. And someone can help me write the mud pile one. Oh, okay. The the picture is in the. I group. think you can continue. Um, I'll be answering the questions in the chat. Just continue. Okay, so, so thank you. Ah, so what biochemistry test um can you do to confirm the cause? So this person most likely had um, they were bleeding, like they were bleeding a lot. So um, they had hypoxia, which was followed by lactic acidosis. Yeah, severe bleeding leading to tissue hypoxia and then uh, lactic acidosis. So um, biochemistry tests that you can do to later confirm this person, Th this person's lactate levels, um, blood glucose, RBS, FBS, or GTT to rule out diabetic ketoacidosis because as we have seen, it's some of the reasons for the and an iron gap. Then we do LFTs to check the level of ALP and the smaller gap. Yeah, thank you. Uh, we can go to the next question. Here they had said photohypertension. Abdomen of a hypertension patient tests to confirm diagnosis associated and electrolyte balance. Um, this one is the caput medusa. It looks like a snake, yes. And then, so what are some tests that you can do for this person? They have uh, portal hypertension. So what are some what are some tests you can do for this person?
Eleftisius, mm -hmm. something else. Yes, serum albumin levels, yes. CBCs, yes. Uh huh. So, can we? Tr Why would we assess the LFTs? Coagulation profile, yes. So here they are showing the effects of portal hypertension, esophageal viruses, then hematemesis, melena, splenomegaly, carpet medusa, ascites. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, so mm, let's go through the tests. They do uh, LFTs to measure the, to assess liver function. It's more for uh, liver function. And then, uh, to, to check the liver function. Then we check CBC. Uh, this test measures different types of blood cells uh, red blood cells, red blood cells, platelets. Portal hypertension can lead to decreased platelet count, a condition known as thrombocytopenia due to increasing, increased pooling of platelets in the spleen. So the CBC will reflect on the, the blood counts and then the coagulation profile. Coagulation profile, because tests such as PT, INR, and APTT may be done to assess the blood's ability to clot. Photo hypertension may disrupt normal clotting mechanisms and do not that some of the clotting factors are produced by the liver. So we're going to, this APTT and PT might, might prolong. Then serum albumin, albumin is a protein produced by the liver and it helps maintain oncotic pressure in the blood vessels. So low levels of serum albumin can indicate liver dysfunction, which can be associated with photohypertension. Then we can check serum bilirubin because bilirubin is usually processed by the liver and excreted in bile. Elevated levels of serum bilirubin may suggest like the liver dysfunction and can be seen in conditions associated with photohypertension. And then we can test for viral hepatitis markers to see if it was a hepatitis case. Yeah, like HBS, HB, hepatitis B surface antigen, hepatitis C virus. Yeah. And we can also do imaging for this patient. Yeah. Imaging, ultrasound, and um, abdominal CT, or and then electrolyte uh, levels. Uh, uh huh. In in uh, in ele in hypertension, there's the elevated pressure within the portal venous system can cause the kidneys to retain sodium and excrete potassium. This can lead to increased sodium levels, hyponatremia and decreased potassium levels, hypokalemia in the bloodstream. Another factor that can lead to these imbalances is the development of ascites. And this, the fluid will accumulate in the abdominal cavity and it will lead to low blood pressure and decreased blood flow to the kidneys. And the kidneys will activate the renin angiotensin system and it will regulate fluid and electrolyte balance and it will retain sodium excrete potassium leading to further electrolyte imbalances yeah yeah we okay with the explanations and everything okay we can go to the next question i think uh tumor markers um you saw the ah uh, i explained the electrolyte one so uh people with Photo hypertension, the it will co the will have a 
Hypertension, it's elevated pressure within the portal venous system. And this will cause the kidneys to retain sodium and excrete potassium. So we'll have hypernatremia and hypokalemia due to the elevated portal venous system, pressure in the portal venous system. Another factor that can cause this hypernatremia and hypokalemia is cause usually people with one, one outcome of Photo hypertension is ascites. So excess fluid will accumulate in the abdominal cavity and it will lead to decreased blood flow in the kidneys. So this will cause the kidneys to elevate the, to activate the renin angiotensin aldosterone system to like cause the kidneys will think we don't have enough, um, enough water because they have decreased, there's decreased blood flow to the kidneys. And then this regulatory mechanism will cause the kidneys to retain sodium and excrete potassium, furthering this uh, hypernatremia and hypokalemia. Yeah. So I think we can go to the next question. Um, tumor markers. I think I sent a uh, some image in the in the WhatsApp group for tumor markers. So CEA, colorectal, breast, pancreas, CA125, ovary, CA15.3, breast and the ovary, CA19.9, pancreas, and the GIT. And then the next question was diagnosis of pancreatic carcinoma. This CA19.9 is useful in the diagnosis of um, any pancreatic carcinoma. Uh -huh. The next, uh, name the instrument above. What's this instrument? Yes, Manchester bottle. Yeah. And test that, the, what are some of its uses? VMA, yes. Cortisol levels, 24-hour urine collection, yes, for the, creat to check creatinine levels, cortisol, acid fast bacilli, microalbumin levels, the microalbumin we were talking about yesterday, you remember? Okay, so I think we can go to the next question. Is that okay? All right. Uh -huh. So the following serum biochemistry results were obtained from a 10-year-old female. Sodium 131, slow. Potassium 4.2, normal. Chloride negative. Oh, uh, no, 89, so it's low. What is the prominent disorder? and then uh, provide one of the commonest causes. So we have hyponatremia and hypochloremia. But the prominent one, we'd say hypo, hypochloremia because it's more of the, the like 131 is low, but it's not as low as the nini. One commonest cause is vomiting and diuretics. Yeah, hypochloremia. Yeah. Then provide one of the commonest causes why we have why we could have this derangement. Vomiting and diuretics. Uh -huh. Let's do this other question now. Wait. For reference interval evaluation for potassium levels. The mean and standard deviation after removal of outliers were as follows mean 4.2, standard deviation 0 0.2. Calculate the reference interval. So we'd use this CA formula. So the reference interval is usually mean plus or minus 
standard deviation times two. So standard deviation is going to be 0 0.2 times two. Mm -hmm. So it's going to be 4.2 plus 0 0.4, which is 4.6. Then that's the higher end. Then um, the lower end of the reference interval, because it has to have a lower and the higher. The lower is going to be 4.2 minus 0 0.4, which is going to be 3.8. So our reference interval will be 3.8 to 4.6. So we just have to shikahi this formula. Mean is plus or minus. Uh, reference interval is equal to mean plus or minus standard two standard deviations. Yeah. I uh have -huh. name one method for removing of outliers. Who can? Who has an idea? Standard curve. Pearson's method, yes. Mm -hmm. Dixon's. Mm. So we have the Z-score method, Grubbs method, Pearson's Dick method, and the Dickinson, Dixon's method. Yeah. I think we can call it a day, and then we start from there. What do you guys think? Oh, we do this next question. Let's do this next question on diabetes, and then we'll call it a day. Mm -hmm. Uh huh. Diabetes mellitus. Mm -hmm. A 46 year old male presents for a wellness check. His fasting blood glucose is 6.7 millimol per liter. What is the diagnosis? What's the diagnosis of this person? They have impaired fasting glucose. Let's just uh, remind it. Yeah, impaired fasting glucose. What additional tests should be done? We do the OGTT, HbA1c, islet cell antibodies, fructosamine test, and the random blood sugar and the microalbumin test. So let's go through the diabetes mellitus uh, ninis. Um, the reference intervals. Random blood sugar should be what? What's the range for the RBS? Yeah, it's three point two to seven. Yes, yes, three point two to seven point eight, and then the fasting blood sugar is usually. 3.3 to 6.1, but there's a lecturer who told us sometimes it can, the upper limit can be 5.9 or something like that. And then um, impaired fasting glucose is if this um, is more than 6.1, but, but between 6.1 and 6.9, then above seven, it's going to be diabetes for, yeah, for fasting blood glucose. Up, more than seven is Diabetes mellitus, yeah. And then the IGT impaired glucose tolerance will have 7.8 to 11.1. Diabetes mellitus, it's usually more than 11.1. Then HbA1c, we went through this one yesterday, 4.6, 5.7 to 6.4, pre-diabetes, then more than 6.5, diabetes, yeah. And then, so additional tests will be the OGTT, so everything. I think we can stop from there and then we'll continue from there next time. Does anyone have a question? Noella, just finish. I think you left with one question. One question. Okay. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just one question. Uh huh. Uh huh. Look at the results. Displayed below, then answer the following questions. CRP, 38.2 milligrams per liter. The biological reference is up to eight. So this one is very high. 
what is the clinical utility of CRP? Yeah, it's a marker for inflammation. Yes, it's a, uh-huh. And do you remember what, what type of protein is it? Yesterday we said it, but we know it all, all of us, we know it. What type of protein? Yeah, acute phase protein. And yeah. Uh -huh. Name two cytokines associated with secretion of CRP. Interleukin-6. Interleukin-1 and tissue necrosis factor. Mm -hmm. Alpha, TNF-alpha, tissue necrosis alpha, factor alpha. Yeah. So we're done with uh, clean chem. We're going to do, we're, 